Ask us a hymn book, turn to number 181. Number 181 in our hymn books. Let us stand and sing together. 181. <clears throat> a sinner Jesus will receive as there is worth of grace to all who pray, pray, all who labor, all who fall, or sing it all and all again. Christ received a sinful need, that made the man declare and pray. Christ received a sinful Come and be with me, dear friend. I trust him for his word is plain. He will take the sinful day. Christ receive a sinful man. I sing it all and all again. Christ receive. Christ receive a sinful me, even me with all my sin. I burst from every spot and stain. You may be seated to choir singing, Heaven will be my resting place.
Amen. Let's all stand together. Turn around and greet someone tonight. Teenagers, come on up as soon as the adult choir comes down. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Good to see you in the Lord's house. And I want to announce if you have children here who are normally in the youth club, they are having youth club tonight. At one time, they had tried to be in here on the same night that uh, we were having uh, the youth service, but they got so backed up from snow days and such that uh, they needed some more class time. And uh, so they are having youth club tonight. So if anyone uh, needs to slip out with a child in youth club, that's fine to do so at this time. Saturday morning visitation, teen activity Saturday, April 5th. Winston-Salem Dash, $8 plus money for food. Um, Holly Prim and Josh Wright wedding, April 12th. Wedding shower for Grant Davis. Uh, this is Ken and Teresa's uh, son. And Brittany York on Sunday, April 13th, 5 to 545 in the Fellowship Building. Uh, graduation information, if you have a son or daughter graduating from high school, please contact the church office by April the 15th. Workers needed for vacation Bible school sign-up sheet is in the vestibule. All right. I believe that's all the announcements. You pray for the youth choir, and they're going to sing for us tonight. So proud of them. Thank God for our young people, and you pray for them as they sing.
Amen. Wasn't that good? Praise the Lord. I'm glad my name's there, aren't you? And I like the fact that those teenagers sang out on that song too. Amen. They always do, but I like. Don't don't tell me this stuff that it's got to be. It's got to sound like the latest rap something and the latest song from Beyonce for teenagers to be okay singing. Amen. Amen. Teenagers that love the Lord uh, gonna like that kind of singing. Amen. That's good. Y'all did good on that. That was wonderful. I know my name's there. Praise the Lord. That sounded like the Freedom Baptist Choir right there. Amen. I like it. Praise the Lord. That was good. Good, good, good. Thank you. And I'm so proud of our youth choir. Amen. I just love you. Young people love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they look like they enjoyed it. Most of them. Amen. About the way the adult choir, most of them look like they enjoyed it. Amen. And the rest is just enduring it, amen. Praise the Lord. So good to see you in the Lord's house tonight. Good to be here and just good to be in God's house. Fellas, come to this time. We'll receive our offering tonight. And I thank you, uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity we have to give. Well, we got two ushers. Amen, good. Wonderful. Great. All right, we got one with this yet, guys? You good? Everybody good? Philip, you lead us in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity to come back to your house and worship you. God, I pray that you'll speak of this offering. I pray that you'll bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. so much talent here at the church. God's blessed us. And any which way you slice it, we can have somebody doing something. We probably got some people play the washboard and the spoon somewhere around here. Amen. And uh, I appreciate folks using their talent for the Lord. And uh, there's always a place in God's work for folks who want to serve him, aren't they? And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. If you have your Bibles ready, Brother Fredericks is going to come in just a moment. And I believe don't tell me, is he going to sing too? No. no. <laughs> That's what you'd say if I was going to sing, amen. Praise the Lord. My wife told me that the Fredericks was going to sing, and I really did think that you was going to be up there with him, I did. And I'm relieved tonight to know that you're not. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then they're going to sing for us tonight. And Brother Frederick will come with the message. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be in church with like-minded believers. Thank you for your precious blood that was shed for our sins so that we could have a home in heaven. Well, thank you for freedom. Thank you for freedom from sin. Thank you for Freedom Baptist Church. Lord, I feel so, uh, so unworthy. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Every day we wake up is a bonus. Thank you. I pray you'll help us to appreciate life tonight. Help us to enjoy you and worship you in spirit and truth. Bless the song now, Holy Spirit of God. I pray you have your hand in everything. Bless Brother Fredericks as he speaks. And I pray that you'll anoint him and help him. And Lord, help us as hearers. I pray that we'll not be hearers only, but doers also of the word. Help us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Without 
guilt or pain so oft abandoned by our transgressions if such a thing as grace exists then grace was made for lives like this there are no strangers there are no outcasts there are no orphans of god so many fallen but hallelujah blessing and uh, I mean that uh, Lord's allowed me to do some things and achieve a few things but uh, there was no more pride than I've had probably in my life and forgive me than sitting down there and seeing those four people sing and uh, really you should thank the Lord there wasn't five and uh, <laughs> all week I've probably heard that song 463 times at the house and every time I try to get in, it always stops. <laughs> I do make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I think he's the only one who appreciates it. But uh, I, I tend to mimic and mock and I hear, I'll, I'll sing and then I'll hear someone's part and I'll jump on it. And then I get bored with that one until I hear another one and I jump to that one. But I'm never really on those parts. From what I've been told, um, I'm kind of in between. Uh, I had to lead singing in the youth group here in California, and our piano player, as we'd get ready to sing a chorus or something, she'd always wait for me to start, and uh, she'd find out what key I'm starting in, and then start the music, and uh, she, I, what did Rachel say? It's kind of in between. It's this and that, and so she'd find it in between and get it going, so, but uh, thank you, family, for singing that. Teenagers, great job singing. I appreciate that, they, and uh, what a blessing. Let's get right into the message and uh, Proverbs chapter number 12. And then we're going to turn to some other passages of Scripture. And uh, by preacher's request, I will not put any Dallas Cowboy apparel on today. Um, as I did last time, I think he got sick to his stomach. We don't want that to happen. 
uh, teenagers going on the youth activity, if you have your money, you can pay me tonight. I'll mark your name off as paid. Picked up the tickets today, wound up getting a few more things. Uh, we got the ticket, then we get a voucher for a free hat. And then, of course, they threw in and gave us these uh, Burger King value meal vouchers. Good for any day. And so there's a little free meal for you afterwards. You'll enjoy that. So pay me tonight or make sure you pay me Saturday, of course. We'll be leaving here at 6 o'clock. And then uh, Brother Steve Cox, he's preaching our uh, teen camp this summer again. And uh, so I was chatting with him, talking. They're doing a tent youth revival starting tonight, tomorrow and Friday. And uh, I may head down there tomorrow. It's a 7 o'clock service. And I may head down there. Any teenage boys interested in going, if you want, if there's three of you, we'll go in my car. If there's a few more, we'll go in a van. If there's a few more, we'll take a bus. But probably going to have to leave here about 545, 6 o'clock. Contact the church office. Just let Miss Carla know if you're interested in going. And uh, if not, I'll just go and have a time with myself. I think Brother Daniel went to this meeting last year, and uh, Richie, and uh, they packed out their auditorium. Then they had an overflow. That's where Brother Daniel got stuck, and it's just different. So they had to find a new place, and so they're going to be meeting down there. If you're interested in going, just contact the office, or you can see me tonight if uh, you're interested in that. Proverbs chapter 12, I believe you're there. One verse, we'll get to it in just a second. Well, um, Proverbs 12, I, I told you all a while back when my good friend, Brother Mike Prim, took me coon hunting for the first time, and... Uh, P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born every minute, and I was that sucker that day. And uh, that's another story in of itself. But I have been hunting before, believe it or not. Uh, when I was a bus captain in Bible college, we had a competition and a contest to uh, bring the most over a certain amount of weeks above your base average and to see folks get saved and walk down the aisle and baptize and things of that nature. And myself and three other fellas won that competition. And, uh, you know, I was a little bummed at first because I'd been in school for several semesters at this time, and there were so many fun activities that were going on. You know, in the fall program of my freshman year, if you won, you got to go to New York City and spend a few days with the bus director there. And my, my next semester program was another, all these fun activities. I won the one where we went hunting for the reward. And uh, we flew from Chicago, Illinois to uh, northeast, uh, western Louisiana, and stayed there for the night and then drove to East Texas. And as our prize, we were going wild boar hunting, okay? We're going for the big old razorbacks with the big tusks, the, the pig, all right? So uh, that was our, our, our prize. Well, the California boy didn't think it'd be good to go in topsiders. And, uh, so, so I borrowed someone's boots, Okay. Now you're laughing because you know, never borrow someone's boots. But I borrowed a roommate's boots and I put those things on. I was walking like a sixth grader wearing high heels for the first sixth grade girl wearing high heels. I know I'm from California. And uh, man, it was just uncomfortable, but I did have a pair of jeans. So I, I was okay there. And I, I had a flannel shirt and I was going wild boar hunting. Uh, the other three that won were Paul Fielder, who's now still a teacher there at City Baptist School there in Chicago, um, and Kevin Cowling, who's a pastor in Arizona, and then Carlos De Leon. Carlos grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He uh, now serves as a Spanish pastor there in Brooklyn, New York at International Baptist Church. And I thought I looked bad, and, but I tried to fit in. You know, I did everything but dip and spit and all that, but I was trying to, he, howdy, you know, and they were just staring at me. They knew. Carlos comes showing up in a pair of penny loafers, <laughs> docker-type pants. He had some sort of sweatshirt on and then another sweater. I'm not joking, that you draped over your... Sh he wasn't wearing the sweater. Remember in the night, you draped it over your shoulder and then you, could, and then you folded the sleeves up? And, uh, okay, so for you hip people, he looked just like Carlton from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, all right? And, uh, and so he shows up. And his city slicker, I show up in my stuff, and we're trying to play the part, and I'm, I'm just trying, and I just don't know how to stand. And we show up there at about 4.35 in the morning, and we meet the crew. And uh, we had gone to a piece of property that has several hundred acres, and they have a pig infestation. So they welcome people to catch them and kill them and get them off the property. So I'm there, I'm, and I'm, I'm nervous because I don't know what to do, and I'm just, you know, so, so they say, let's explain to you what's all's going on. It's okay. So I look over here, there's four-wheelers. So I've noticed so far that's how we're traveling through this acreage, okay? Then he pointed out there were the bay dogs. These were the dogs you send out first, Brother Tim, and they pick up the scent, 
And they go after it, about two or three of those bay dogs, little hounds. I don't know if they were red ticks or blue ticks or English or Spanish. I don't know. I just know they were hounds, okay? But they did have the GPS net uh, uh, thing around their neck. So just in case they got too far and you couldn't hear the bark. And, and you guys who go coon, you know there's different barks for when they're on their trail, for them when they see it, and then when it's ready to go. And so the bay dogs. Then there were the catch dogs. The catch dogs were pit bulls. And these were albino pit bulls, and they were bred just through family, and they keep them, and then they, they breed them and keep two pups, and they train them, and it just stays in the family. Several generations of catch dogs, insomuch that it's so much in the family, the two dogs do the same thing every time. They corner the pig, and I thought we were going to shoot the pig. And uh, they inform me that they, once they corner the pig in an area, and uh, they pull the bay dogs out and release the catch dogs. The catch dogs then go in. One always goes for an ear on the pig and just grabs a hold of it and tries to pull it down. The other then goes for the neck, all right? And those two work together, hold the pig. Then one of the guides goes in and grabs the back legs of the pig and lifts it up. Now, if you're like me, you're learning. That's how the pigs run. Everything is back leg. Front legs are just balanced for the back legs to recoil and kick off again. And I said, we're not, we're not grabbing the back legs, right? He said, no, 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 we'll do that. And so uh, they proceeded to tell me that about a month or two earlier, they were on a hunt. And uh, before the second dog could get around the neck, Brother Roy, the first dog grabbed the ear. This pig weighed about 350 pounds. And when it got cornered and the dog grabbed the ear, it just started rearing its head back and forth. Well, that pit bull doesn't let go. And boy, his body would fling up and slide down and fling up. And every time it slid down, its chest would land on that, that husk, on that pig. And finally, on one raise up, the other dog came in, got it. They said that dog was split open right down its, uh, its stomach. Brother Roy, they said by the time they got done sewing it, he was laying on his back just, <laughs> just loving it. They put three staples in his forehead from the other wounds. And I said, I'm glad I'm not a dog, amen? Uh, now, today I thought I would want to, want to be one. My dogs just sleep and lay around the backyard all day. But these dogs work hard and do all that. Then, So when they grab it, they get the catch dogs out. Then you go in, and this is how they kill the pig. They give you a knife. It, this knife looks like, makes, it makes Rambo's knife look like a little Swiss Army knife with the toothpick and tweet. I mean, it, this thing was huge. And, uh, boy, you take it, and then the, so one guy's holding the back legs. Then the killer gets to come in and stick the knife in the heart of the pig. All of a sudden, I, thought, I was wondering if I really won a contest or if I was being tortured at this time. I'm not, I didn't want to be there after re- hearing all that. So we're drawing straws. Who gets to go first? This may have been, again, early in my Christian life, this was one of the biggest answers of prayer that I'd ever had in my life right here. I got the fourth straw, praise God. Kevin Callan got the first one. Paul had the second one. Carlos had the third one. I got the, I'm going, all right, I'll last. I was like, oh, man, oh, uh, yeah, you know. And so here we go. We get out on there. and So I'm thinking, how are we going to get paired up? Each of the guides gets on a four-wheeler and, they're finding out where we're from, and Kevin's from Indiana, and Paul's from Michigan, and Clint's from California. Nobody wanted to partner up with me on the four-wheeler. And uh, so I get on one that doesn't have mud flaps. They, they kind of just, well, you're stuck on this one. So I get on that one, and again, I had never ridden a four-wheeler at this time. So I, didn't, I just got on, and I was like, okay, where, boy, man, this guy jumped up, got out, hey, 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 I was like, what? He says, uh, just, just, no, no, leave me, don't touch me. And I was like, it's okay. it's okay. He said, where are you from? I said, <laughs> California. And uh, so now that, that made sense then. So, so, so I'm on the four-wheeler, but, but good thing, that didn't wind up being a problem, Miss Peggy. They, they gave me a bay dog to hold. So I had to hold one of the dogs on my lap as we were going hunting. So we got the bay dogs. They did have a little thing on the front of the four-wheeler with a cage that they put each of the catch dogs in there, but we had to hold the bay dogs. So we start rolling, going out, sun's just creeping through the trees and everything, and here we go. And I mean, just ready to go. We drive for about 30 minutes. We drive for about an hour, and I'm thinking, boy, this hunting thing ain't all what it's cracked up to be. Then finally, one of the bay dogs just starts calling. He's howling and going, and they said, let the dogs go. So we just... Let the dogs go. We stopped the four-wheelers, and two of the bay dogs went this way, and this one went in over here. And we're waiting, 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 and oh, man, this one fished out an armadillo. 
And so we're all sitting on there, and this old boy got off, took his gun out, shot the armadillo, then picked up the armadillo by the tail and went to his dog and began to beat the living daylights out of his dog, saying, that's not a pig, that's not a pig, that's not a pig. And I leaned at Carlos and said, if I'm ever doing anything wrong, tell me before he starts hitting me with an armadillo. I mean, he was just beating us. They, they tied that dog up, and they were hitting him. That's not a... Rah, rah, rah. I wanted to cry for them. And they, I guess that's how you teach them, right? Spare the armadillo, spoil the dog. And it's somewhere in, I think, second hesitations. I think we'll look at it later. But, but as we see this all taking place, finally we get the dogs back, and we start going about another 30, 45 minutes. They're on another scent. We let them go. And all of a sudden, they're barking, and we're just waiting, just sitting there, waiting, waiting. They're barking, and all of a sudden, the, they start to change direction, and we heard it over here at first. Now we hear it over here, and then all of a sudden, the bark was different, Brother Martyr. It was a, it was, it, martyr, martyr. It was a different bark, and all of a sudden, these guys' eyes got white. Oh, let's go, boys. And, man, they took off, and they grabbed the catch dogs, Brother Jimmy, and they're chasing, and don't, don't ever get in back of the chase. That's the worst, because all these limbs are being pushed aside, and then they come back, wham, they just hit you. So you got to be careful going through there. We get all the way through, and you can hear the barking getting louder. We're getting closer. These catch dogs are salivating. I want to get after it, want to get after it. And finally we get there, and at least I got there. They'd already been there. They got the bay dogs all tied up to a tree over here, and they didn't release the catch dogs. They tied the catch dogs up. And I was like, is there a pig? They're like, yeah, there's a pig. I said, what do we need to catch dogs? They're like, no. And over in the corner was a 35-pound baby pig. I mean, it wasn't snorting. It wasn't grunting. It was whining. It was like, meh, meh, meh. The guide went over and picked the pig's two legs up in his one hand and just held it up like this. And he goes, all right, whose turn is it to kill? And Kevin came for it because he drew the straw for first. And, man, he got up there. I think the knife was bigger than the pig, to be honest. I mean, it was, it was just hilarious. 35-pound pig. The guy so he's all just lay it down right here. And he laid it down. And, and he says, I want you to put the knife through right here. And I think Kevin, really, if we were to ask him, I think he was nervous, too. He had been hunting, but not like this. And so all of a sudden, he goes, ready, right there? And the guy's like, yeah, go ahead. And he goes, all right. And, man, he just whoop right through it. I mean, like a hot knife in butter. It just went right through. That pig just, ah! And then it stopped. It breathed a few times and then stopped breathing. Man, when Kevin stuck that knife in, he acted like Tarzan, man. He's like, Aah! like it was the 350-pound pig we heard about. I mean, he stuck it in there. He starts turning. Aah! Aah! He steps away like the WWF champion. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're all standing over here going, Really? <laughs> really? I mean, 35-pound little baby pig, and he killed that pig. This guy picked it up, shook it a little bit, took a smaller knife out. And this was where I was getting sick. He started at one end and went to the other, Brother Jimmy, with that knife. And he just started to pull stuff out. He just threw it down everywhere. I'm like, don't those need to go in green ecological bags to be put in some canister off to the side or, you know, California Environmental Impact Report or something, and... And they're just throwing out, ah, the buzzards will get it. And they ripped all the stuff out there. It started steaming up. They took the carcass left of the pig, strapped it to one of the four-wheelers, and we were off again. We got going again, looking for another one. One hour, two hour, three hour. Now, to be honest, after seeing that, I was like, you know, if I get a 35-pounder, I'll be okay with that, you know. But don't give me one of them 300-pounders. So we're still going, 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 and man, we can't catch a scent for anything. It's starting to drizzle a little bit. That probably had something to do with it, but we just start riding along, and they said, well, let's head over to this other side of the property, and we take off. We're going full speed ahead. I'm freezing to death. I thought it was just the, the rain and all that, but I realized after riding for several hours, Brother Roy, I had about 13 pounds of mud on my back. From all the riding we've been doing, all, there was no mud flaps. It was landing on Clint's jacket. And I'm, I was just, aren't you guys cold? No, oh, man, it's hot. I mean, I'm free. And I realized my coat weighed about 12 pounds worth of mud. And I said, can we just get out? He said, well, I'll just get it off. So he opens it wide up. He thinks if we just start riding and going fast, all the mud's going to fall off of my jacket. These are the intelligent people we are going hunting with. So he opens it up, and more mud is flapping onto my backside at this time. And finally we go, and then all of a sudden, all our next thing I remember is we started making left turns for about 12, 20 seconds. 
We're going, one, then, just like that. Our back left tire fell off. <laughs> fell off. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't shrap metal. It wasn't a shot from the, it, it fell off. And so we're doing circles in the mud. We get off, the, the, the tire goes on. There's a cotter pin that's supposed to be on there. It broke off. So these guys are whittling down pieces because we're in the middle of nowhere. They'd stick one in and boom, we'd go for a little bit. It'd break again. They'd stick another one in. It took us so long to get home. Finally, while they're trying to fix that, one of the country boys just took the pig right off the four-wheeler. He tried to get his knife and get some of the hair off the edge of it there, and we had a fire going, Brother Roy, and he threw it on there. It wasn't long. We were eating jerky. And Brother Steve, I, it wasn't that bad. It was real chewy, but, but man, it, it wasn't bad. And these guys cooked it up, man. And you know what? We got to enjoy part of our kill. That was neat. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, and I'm not against it. I just don't do it. I'd rather golf than hunt, and that's fine. Some of you would rather fish than hunt. Some of you would rather hunt than fish. Some of you just rather do whatever. And that's fine. I'm not here. But just think about whichever couple it is in here that likes to hunt. And Ralph has about X amount of dollars worth of gear to go hunting, Right? And Ralph gets up, and not only does he have good stuff to go hunting with, every year he seems to have to get one more piece to add to the artillery, whether it's part of the outfit, whether it's part of the arsenal. He's just got to get the newest and latest and greatest. If we were to sum up all that Ralph has spent on hunting, it could be way up there. But Gazelda just smiles and says, oh, look, look at our trophy case. <laughs> and so finally, Ralph wakes up about 2.30 in the morning, meets up with his buddies at 3, heads out to the tree stand, unless it's on his own property, Brother Color. He just goes to the backyard and just lets it fly, right? And, uh, but, but he maybe goes to his area, his tree stand, and he sits and he waits. Sometimes it's a good day. Man, you're there 30 minutes, boom, you get it, you're going home. Sometimes you got to wait a while. But whatever the case may be, man, when that 73-point buck comes through, right, and you are you just, oh, 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 yeah, I can't wait to put this on the wall. Here you go. And, man, can you imagine shooting that thing? And then coming home, Ralph, to your wife, Gazelda, and there she is. How'd it go? Oh, it went wonderful. Did you see anything? Oh, man, 76-point rack. It came right in front of me, one shot. Boom, it was, I didn't have to chase it. It just shot it, fell down. It just almost said, here you go, and he just laid there for me. He, that's, it was wonderful. And Gazelda goes, great, where is it? And Ralph goes, ah, I just left it out there. It's just a deer. Just a, we have people in our church who will pick up the dead one on the side of the road, just a deer let alone going out and sitting in the tree stand and waiting and look. I mean, if there's still another piece on the tag that you can fill, you're picking it up. I remember calling preacher. I went jogging. Was it last winter or something? I was, uh, no, it was summer. And I went jogging, and over by, uh, by our house, I came across, I think it fell out of someone's pickup. I mean, it was a little gray bag like this, but the deer was stuffed all in it. I mean, it was just in there. And I remember running by it, and I went, oh, venison. I text preacher. I took a picture of it. I said, preacher, do you think I could take this somewhere and get the meat from it? He goes, Brother Fredericks, get as far away from that as possible, please. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but get away as far as possible. I said, okay. But, but, but I'm just saying, if Ralph were to go out there, shoot the 76-point buck, and just leave it there and come home and tell Gazelda, and then he starts telling you boys, oh, yeah, last week shot me a 76-point buck. Man, came around under me. I waited. One shot, boom, down, dead. It was gone. Where is it? I just left it there. You know, a lot of you would say, first of all, you go, liar. Here's another story. But then others of you would be, you're an idiot. You spend all this money for your equipment, all this money for your gear, all this time to go out there. You sit in the tree stand, you see the greatest of greatest things there. You shoot it with one shot, it's right there. You don't have to drag, pull, go. You just get it, put it in the truck and go, and you, you left it there? We'd say he's an idiot. The Bible has another term for this person. Proverbs chapter 12, are you there? All right, let's get right to the message now. Verse 27. Proverbs chapter 12. Verse number 27, the Bible says, The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man 
is precious. We'd say, ah, you idiot. God would call that type of person a slothful person. Now let's understand quickly what slothful is. Slothfulness cannot be confused with laziness. There's a difference, okay? Laziness is is someone who's disinclined to activity. He'd rather sit on the sideline and sip the lemonade. Now, someone who's disinclined to activity, who's not going to participate at this point, may at some point in the future participate. But at this time, he's not. So he's on the sidelines. He's not participating. He would be viewed and defined by laziness, a disinclination to activity. Sloth. What is a sloth? Slothfulness is a disinclination to exert one's self. You see, there's a difference. While the lazy person is choosing to sit on the sidelines and not participate, the slothful person's part of the group. The slothful person's on the team. But they're riding on the coattails of the other guys who are just tearing it up and working their tails off, and they just are along for the ride. Paul uses a term for this. Let's turn quickly to the New Testament and let's turn, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. You know, when you think of this slothful person, it's almost like someone who has a head cold. The disinclination to exert oneself. You know when you have a head cold? You're not too sick to go to the doctor, but you're not well enough to be very effective either. Right? I mean, I ain't going to the doctor for this. Make my copay, do this, do that, da, 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 get some of that, sit in line for four hours. Uh-uh, no. I'll be fine. I'll be okay. And you just get through the day like that. But then at work, you're not real effective. It's like, hey, Jimmy, can you? Oh, man, I'd love to, but now I got this head cold. I just can't participate. You know, it's just, that's, it's just, we're just hoping it runs its course and goes through. Slothful. Paul has a word for them in the New Testament church in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse 11. 2 Thessalonians 3.11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Turn over now to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Not only did he write it there to the church at Thessalonica, he wrote it to Timothy, whom he left in charge of a church. 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 13. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies. Busybodies. They are so involved in everything that they really aren't accomplishing anything. They have all these Badges they wear. Oh, I'm part of this. I'm part of that. I'm part of this. I was reading on how to get into college, and they said, you know, what what was happening was so many students were just saying, I'm a part of the beta club, the theta club, the drama club, the this club. They were saying they're a part of all these clubs. And then they were wondering why they weren't being accepted to these big private schools. It's because they realized folks who are a part of so many things are stretched so thin that they can hardly be effective in any of them. Do y'all remember? Ah, forget it. Here we go. It wasn't bad. It was just an illustration I was going to use, but it won't work here. Here we go. Slothfulness. Disinclination to exert oneself. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. It's a scripture principle from Ecclesiastes. If you don't obey that verse, you are being a slothful individual. Brother Roy, I would imagine if you were to need some work done on the farm and Brother Mark couldn't handle all of it, I mean, I know you work them pretty good, but let's just say there was a big job and you could hand pick, I would guarantee you Brother Roy would hand pick not slothful people. Right? Now, why would Brother Roy be any more specific than God. Wouldn't you like to be known as someone that God would want to pick because he knows you would give your best effort? Now look, I jokingly say this, I can't sing, but I'm going to give everything I can to singing wrong as best as I can. 
That's why my family gets nervous. Because they know dad's not, you don't have to worry about dad. Dad, you're not loud enough. Not a problem with Brother Clint. I'm always going to, if I have a microphone, it's going to be, I'm going to eat that microphone because I'm going to make sure I can be heard. Yeah, but you sound terrible. Okay, but I'm doing it with all my might. Some of you have a gift and a talent and you're hiding it. And you're not letting us hear you sing. You're not letting us hear you play. You're not letting us use that instrument up here like these guys did up here. And wasn't that good quartet to see the, all these young boys singing with their grandpappy like that? I just thought that was great, be able to play like that. And woo. Just checking to make sure you're awake. I just saw that relaxed position, praying for the preacher. Slothful. That's the whole message. Let's not be slothful in all that we do. How many of you are grateful that whenever we have a food fellowship out there that Miss Peggy is not a slothful cook? Well, it said put that chicken in for 45 minutes, but, you know, 30, 45, what's the difference, you know? Oh, there's a difference. That's why we men aren't cooking in there. We want it quick. We want it now. It could say, you know, 45 minutes at 300 degrees. So we'd be like, all right, let's put it in for like 20 minutes at 600 degrees. That'll work, right? (laughs) Slothful. So many things we can talk about. To you teenagers, to those of you young adults who are taking a few credits at a community college or you're enrolled full time at uh, like Bethany is at UNC, I started to name them, here we go, I'm going to be messed up now, but Chelsea and all these others who attend college, and Andrew, and uh, all right, so sorry, if I didn't mention you, I apologize, but I do have you on my list that we pray for every week, and uh, so, 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 so as we go through that, you know what, don't be a slothful student, you know, it's sad, uh, it's sad, and I, I, I almost got to be careful not to complain about it, but how long were we studying yesterday with the kids? Yeah, yeah, too long. And, and man, I was just like, guys, I, I want us to ball game. No, I'm, uh, but, but, but man, we were going over this, and I got done. All right, good, Tab. All right, whoo. She's like, no, Dad, I got two more. I'm like, <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, and so, so we're studying and reviewing and going over and going over. All right, thanks, Tab. All right, good. All right, then Tiffany, oh, Dad, can, can you help me? Oh, yeah, well, does, does, maybe your mom could help. But you know what? At the end of the night, I just thought of this. We just had unbelievable family time without the TV on or anything for the last several I don't know, hour, hour and a half, however long it was. Seemed like eternity for me. I was like, man, I'm glad I'm not in school. Then the scary part when your son goes, Dad, this this calculus problem, I'm like, "Uh, YouTube, Uh, I can't help you with that one, son. We may have to call the workmen in the future for that. We'll we'll see if we can get it going. But but you know what? Don't be a, I'm I'm amazed how students, and again, I was one of these, but I wasn't a Christian. (laughs) But, But if you know this principle, Give yourself to your studies. It's going to help you if you want to go to... I'm always amazed at these kids who are, you know, they, they, they never turn in their projects or all this and that. And you're like, hey, what are you going to do like? Oh, I'm going to go to a state college and I'm going to get a full ride. I'm like, how? I say, you don't even have the character now to show up every day and to get your projects turned in. And what are you going to just wake up one day? Don't be a slothful student. A disinclination to exert one's self. That term paper's due Monday? Why didn't they tell us? They did. It's called a course syllabus. They give it to you at the beginning of the semester with all the important dates for you to be aware of. It's the one you shoved underneath your locker, remember? And, uh, or you made a paper watch so you could throw it at that friend in the hallway. That's where it said it. A slothful student. How about this? How about don't be, I'm just reading through these. How about don't be a slothful subordinate? Someone who is ranked below. This goes for all of us at work. I hope your boss is getting what he's paying you. If he's paying you X amount of dollars an hour, I hope you're working to be worth that amount. Now, I know some of you, well, I'm really worth more. Really? Okay, well, we'll ask your boss that. A subordinate. Also as a subordinate, as a son or a daughter, teenagers, don't be a slothful son or daughter. Hey, uh, so-and-so, can you do this? (sighs) Okay. But if your coach asks you to do something, yeah, coach, what can I do for you? And let me say this, if preacher or Brother Clint call you and ask you to do something here at the church, don't be more excited to come spend time with us and help us out here than you are to spend time with the mom and dad that love you more than us. We love you too, somewhat, Uh, but, but we love you too. But they're the ones who care for you, nourish for you daily. They're the ones who write the checks and send you off and this and that. So don't come back and go, man, Preacher White was awesome. We did this, this, and this. this, this." Man, working is so much fun. And then your dad says, hey, let's go get these leaves up. You're like, oh. 
Don't be a slothful subordinate. Don't be a slothful servant. Luke 17 says, when thou hast done what has been commanded to do, consider yourself unprofitable servants. If you're supposed to do this much, always do that much. It's like that old boy, his daddy gave him an open checkbook. He says, well, he says, I'll give you this much money. I want you to build me a house. Anything you can save or anything, I'll wind up giving back to you in cash. So, boy, he started cutting corners, preacher. It could get done, really, but he could cut corners and have this one guy do it who's not like this guy. And da, 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 da. Boy, he got it all done. Saved a ton of cash, cutting corners. Yeah, that's a good door. It's not the best door, but, man, I want to save money. He did all that. When he got it all done, his dad wrote him a check, gave it to him, and gave him the keys and said, here's your new house. (laughs) You heard that term, it's your bed, you made it, you have to sleep in it. That guy did too. (laughs) Slothful subordinate, slothful servant. How about this, a slothful spouse? We just had a wonderful couples retreat, and we hope many of you can make it next year. And this isn't a commercial to try to get more people going. We really were packed out the way it was, but they said we can have some more people. But just the fellowship, just the reminders, just the thoughts were were tremendous. I think some of you couples were afraid it's going to be like an AA meeting for marriages, you know. (laughs) My name's Zena. (laughs) And I've been married for X amount of years. And in 1989, one time Randy, no, it wasn't. It was a fun time of fellowship and teaching and, can I say this, and Holy Ghost conviction. And I know some of us, uh, well, you know, I mean, I'm just setting my ways. I've been married this way for so long. I mean, we don't really need help. I mean, good, good, good. I thought Brother Wilsons were there. And we got done with the the, the clinic that said, whew, good, I'm glad we came. Now we'll reach 50 years in another month or two, I think it was, right? And, uh, but you know what, we, uh, it's funny, we treat our marriage like that. Well, you know, it's okay, but everything else we don't. Try to keep that car without changing the oil every three or 4,000 miles. Now, I'm not talking about bad things. I'm just talking upkeep every now and then. And so you, what you're saying sometimes is that my vehicle, and in a year's amount of time, the $29.95 I spend about every five or six months, which would be equivalent to a marriage conference price that our church graciously reduced and allowed many to come anyway, and you're saying that that car, in a sense, is more important than your marriage. I mean, did we just stop learning to be a good spouse? You're not going to know this, but I got a haircut today. And you know, I was home for about three hours before my wife said anything. (laughs) Now, that really doesn't bother me. I was just joking with her on that, but... I got to be aware when she gets her hair cut, though. And then when they try to set us up, fellas, you're like, oh, honey, you got your hair done. And then they ask us, do you like it? And I don't know how to answer because I'm not sure if she likes it yet, right? Because I could be like, oh, I love it. Then she goes, well, they cut it too short. I can't believe it. Yeah, 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 that's what I meant. I like it longer, but, you know, oh, that's the way. We just get that way. Can I just tell you, we all, it's, it's a never-ending battle to try to understand your mate. It's always good just to get away and go to those things. Don't be a slothful spouse. They deserve the best. And so if we had a conference to make you a better worker at your place of employment, and Drew, we send you to El Paso, Texas for for a week, two weeks or whatever it was to make you a better employee. If we'll do that, let's make sure our spouse gets the best spouse possible. Don't be a sloth. Don't be a sloth. All these things we mentioned, don't be a slothful soul winner. Don't be a slothful soul winner. Be conscious that the gospel needs to get out. Get the gospel out. I was in a meeting and the preacher said this. It was so profound. Preacher, you know who hands out gospel tracts? People who have gospel tracts. <laughs> and it's hard to hand them out when you ain't got one. 
And I've been guilty. We've been there sometimes. We're at a restaurant. We're like, oh, honey, go, go, you know, because my wife's got to have something in the purse, right? I mean, good night. There's everything in the purse. Honey, get a track. She's like, oh, I don't have one. We're like, oh, what? There's no truck. You got to run to the car, find one, go around. But just leave a gospel track. Go through the drive through Leave a track. Man, this rural hall McDonald's should just get inundated with tracks. The, the, the King's hot dog, all that stuff, man. Just leave a track, leave a track, leave a track. Sow the seed. Let God take care of the rest. You know, I was putting this together. I got convicted. All these S's. I said, you know what? I don't want to be a slothful son-in-law. God got me. I tried to just pass it off, but I couldn't. <sighs> so I had to get right. But you know, when you got a mother-in-law like I do, <laughs> I, I know it seems weird to do this, but listen to this. Got this text message from her. Want you to know I love you and am praying much for you as you preach tonight and as our teenagers sing. All for his glory. Now that's better than the other one I got where she says, I just checked the weather app and it looks like a tornado's going to come. I'm in the basement. <laughs> She's a mother-in-law. So many things we could say, but here's the truth. Are you slothful in any area of your life? Let's not be a sloth. The disinclination to exert oneself. When it's time for your morning devotions, I hope you give of yourself to it. When it's time to sing and Brother Roy asks us to sing, I hope you'll give yourself to it. Pray for Nathan. Nathan stands next to me when I sing. And you know what? I'm giving myself to sing. And I think sometimes Nathan tries to turn the book, you know. I notice him moving that a lot. Don't be a slothful singer. Let's exert ourselves in everything we can for the Lord. Yeah, but I'm just pacing myself. Really? Take no thought for your life. You may not have it tomorrow. Um, another funeral this week, you know, and uh, let's give ourselves 100%. Father in heaven, I pray you'll take this truth. Help us to apply it to our lives. I don't know what area it is for a young person or an adult or a family here, but, man, I know me. I need to exert myself. I'm glad on Sundays, boy, it's Sunday night when you go to bed, you just... Whew, what a good feeling to know you've given yourself. I, I know the feeling that the